Well, um, welcome to this month's <coughs> Senior Partners presentation. Um, I do recognize a few faces here, and I really do appreciate all of you coming out uh, this very snowy afternoon. Um, I'm sure many of you know why February is American Heart Month. It's because there's usually a lot of snow, and people go shovel snow, and then they get heart attacks, and, uh, <laughs> and so it makes um, heart disease prominent. So this evening, I want to take you through cardiology and cardiovascular services at Worcester Hospital. And the topic is titled, Then and Now. I want to chronicle the advances that we have made in this hospital and in this community over the last 20 years or so. I'm not going to make it a very technical talk, so for those of you who have questions about your blood pressure or <laughs> coronary disease or your pacemakers, um, I may not be able to answer some of those questions. Now, I know they are, they are videotaping this, so some of the slides may be a little difficult to see. But this is our hospital, uh, circa 1949. Um, I was not around then. Uh, I joined <laughs> sometime afterwards. I'm not going to say you guys, some of you guys were around then, but um, I think some of you were around then. Um, so this is what the hospital looked like, and uh, you can recognize the entrance here where the, this is where the physician's parking lot is nowadays. Uh, and the administrator sits up here, the nursing offices are over here, and I hear these used to be patient rooms, uh, but are no longer patient rooms, and they are mostly taken over by administration. Well, this is what many of you recognize now, uh, which is the tower on the other side. Uh, so these improvements were made uh, a couple of decades later. Now, some of you may remember that um, in the old days, when you came to this hospital, if you had heart disease, you were basically taken care of by your primary physician. There were no cardiologists then. And in fact, up until this time, there were still no cardiologists in Worcester. So in the 80s and early 90s, there were actually no cardiologists in Worcester. And if you had a heart attack or you had a heart problem, you lay in bed and you would get a cardiologist come once or twice a week from Canton. So if you came in on a Tuesday afternoon after the cardiologist had made his rounds, uh, you were out of luck until Thursday when he came back. And there were very few tests which were, were ordered at that time. But the primary care physicians were capable as per the standards. But I think if you left Wayne County and you left Worcester, the standards would have been a little different. In the mid-1990s, Mr. Sharon, who is still the CEO of the hospital, uh, came to Worcester. I'm not quite sure where he came from. I think it was maybe Tennessee, uh, came to Worcester. Um, and one of the things that he was most interested in was expanding the services that Worcester Hospital uh, could provide. Uh, and he was particularly interested in cardiovascular services in addition to other things. Um, so he actually laid the groundwork and the foundation to recruit as many people as possible to see whether we could provide some of these services here. Now I'm going to restrict my talk basically to cardiology. So um, other subspecialties and services I'm not going to touch on, not because they're not important, uh, but because they're not my specialty. So after Mr. Sharon came, Soon after that, about a year or two afterwards, in 1996-97, Dr. Nikolazakis came into town. Uh, many of you recognize him. I'm sure he was your physician. 
popularly or affectionately known as Dr. Nick. Uh, and he was really the first cardiologist who came to Worcester. And he changed the way cardiology was practiced in Worcester. So it was no longer an itinerant service, but he was here every day and would make recommendations uh, on the care of the patients. But you can imagine that in the uh, mid to late 1990s, um, there was actually quite little that we could do in this hospital. Um, some of the services that were offered were echocardiography, uh, that uh, they were done here, but they would bring a machine from another hospital over here, and he got some of the echo machines, and the echocardiography is when we use sound waves to take a look at your heart function. We look at the heart muscle, we look at the heart valves, uh, we look to see whether you have a strong heart or a weak heart. I'm I know some of you have had those tests. So these are what the echocardiographic machines look like. Um, and then nuclear stress testing uh, was also introduced. Uh, we used to have them on a sort of a part-time basis, but then it became a daily test. So we offer them, at least during the week, every day. And what nuclear stress testing does is it figures out whether you have a blockage in any particular part of your, your heart muscle. And you can either walk on a treadmill or we can give you medication to simulate exercise. Uh, and usually you go through this donut after we've run you on a treadmill or given you the medication and then we take pictures and then we compare before and after pictures so that we can uh, decide whether a particular area of the heart is not getting enough, enough blood uh, and then decide what we're going to do with that. Um, another form of testing that was also available uh, in the late 1990s uh, was cardiac rehabilitation. Patients who had suffered heart attacks, you know that we usually encourage them to start exercise. Many of them are afraid. So it's helpful to have a supervised program here. Uh, and, and that was also established in the hospital. Many of you would recognize Tim, uh, who is no longer here, but you know, he, he did supervise a number of people uh, uh, in the cardiac uh, rehabilitation program. Cardiac rehab is actually essential to improving your heart health. So um, we do recommend you know, anyone who's had a heart attack or who's had a stent to, to go through cardiac rehabilitation. Because over the years, we've found that people who go through cardiac rehabilitation actually live longer and they do better than those who say, I can exercise on my own, or I can just walk around the garage, or I can walk around Lowe's or Walmart or wherever it is they want to walk. <coughs> Another service that we offer here is also vascular services. So vascular services are when we use ultrasound to look to see whether you have a blockage in your neck or a blockage in your legs or whether you have an aneurysm uh, uh, in, in your aorta. Uh, and we use sound waves, and you can see one of our techs here, Tim, uh, who is checking this lady's neck to see whether they have uh, any significant blockage. <coughs> so these were some of the tests that were, were being offered uh, in, the, in the late 1990s. And when we found any significant problem, we had to send you out of Worcester to one of the other hospitals, either Altman, or Akron, or Cleveland Clinic, Ohio State, or for those who wanted to go out of state, wherever. So many people were leaving the, the county for treatment for their heart disease that we could not offer in this hospital. One of the newer tests that came along uh, in the 2000s was this test called a cardiac CT, where we're using CAT scans to diagnose whether you had heart, heart uh, blockages or not. Did th this did not involve a catheterization. It was a simple CAT scan, and you could look at the blood vessels to see whether there was any area of blockage. And then, of course, after that, we'll still have to send you out and, and do a real angiogram 
uh, and treat you. So even though we were quite happy with what we were doing here, we felt that we needed to take it a notch higher or a step higher, or at least some of us felt that. So this bloke comes along <laughs> and says that, why are we sending all these patients out of Worcester to different hospitals? for services like angiograms or heart catheterizations. We can build a heart cath, cath lab in Worcester. So we approached the CEO, who was very willing. We approached the hospital board, who gave us their full support. And we set about setting up a, a heart catheterization lab in Worcester. So that was in 1999 to 2000. Uh, we did go ahead and recruit uh, some good technicians and technologists from area hospitals, many of whom are still with us today, um, all these years later. Uh, and uh, we're joined later on by Dr. Mudispa, who uh, many of you also recognize, uh, who is still here. So we basically formed the um, triumvirate to set up the heart catheterization lab here. Now, some of you here have undergone heart catheterization. The other name is angiograms. Uh, and what we do is that we go usually through the groin uh, up into the heart. We introduce these tiny catheters. And then with the tiny catheters, we can inject some material, contrast material, which would outline the heart vessels. And we can see whether you have any blockage or not. And the next image would actually show you what it looks like. So this is the heart cath lab. This is a patient. This is the tech. This is the physician here. We have all the equipment. Uh, and um, if we could dim the lights a little bit, possibly, we could, I could show you a little bit about this, what this procedure looks like and how it shows up. So this here is the catheter, this line that you see up here. And this maze that you see here is what your blood vessel looks like. And I'm sure all of you can see this pinch right here in this blood vessel which supplies the front of the heart. So we could now diagnose conditions like this. And if you have a blockage like this in your heart, this could be responsible for why you'll get chest pain if you walk upstairs, or chest pain if you shovel snow, or shortness of breath if you're going upstairs, or taking the laundry, or going to the mailbox. Or in some cases, when this shuts off completely, you may not be around to tell the story. And that is what we call sudden death. So we started diagnosing this lots of people with this condition but we still had to send them outside to a different hospital for definitive treatment because for some of these patients they needed open heart surgery or some of them needed stents put in and we couldn't do stents here in Worcester so this is the picture of the triumvirate that I told you. That's yours truly and Dr. Mudispa in his younger days. And that's Dr. Nick. Uh, and, and here we are. You can't see it very well, but Sammy Davis is over here. And then Dean Martin. And uh, <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean. So um, <clears throat> now, so there were the three of us cardiologists here. And then we were joined by two and subsequently three other cardiologists also in the Cleveland Clinic. Now, it is interesting to note that some people had made comments in the mid-1990s that we don't need cardiology in Worcester. <laughs> so between 1995 and maybe 2002, we had grown from zero cardiologists to six cardiologists. And we were busy. And since the 1990s, we have provided cardiology service here in Worcester 24-7, 365 days a year. And certainly, <laughs> and certainly with our group, there has been no day or no hour 
since 1996 that there has not been a cardiologist on call in this hospital. So we were joined by Dr. Schaefer, and then there was a picture of Dr. Werner here, who has since retired, and then Dr. Polinski, uh, both of whom uh, work at the Cleveland Clinic. And they were also um, participating in some of the uh, testing and treatment uh, measures that we were undertaking here in the hospital. Now, one of the other services that we also introduced here was pacemakers and defibrillators, because before we were not doing any pacemakers, so if you came in with a slow heart rate or you had passed out, just like the lady I treated two days ago who was getting into her car and felt that she was going to pass out, and so came into the emergency room and her heart rate was 30, so um, we had to put in a pacemaker, um, and this is what the pacemaker looks like. And then we put two wires into her heart. So had this lady been here 15 years before, we would have had to put her in an ambulance and then ship her to Hospital St. Elsewhere. Okay. So this was another um, procedure that we introduced here. Um, defibrillators are bigger pacemakers. They function just like pacemakers, but what they do is that they are able to deliver your heart a shock if you should go into an abnormal heart rhythm. So it performs your own mini personal CPR. Defibrillator treatment was also not available here in Worcester. And we collaborated with some of our physician colleagues at the Ohio State Medical Center. And this is the the chief of electrophysiology at Ohio State Medical Center, and he agreed that once a month he would come here and place defibrillators so Worcesterites don't have to travel out of Worcester to get this service. In fact, he was here today and he put two defibrillators in. So we really have been very fortunate to have some of these services delivering care as locally as possible. Now, I would also add that in the early days, my partners and I used to go to Akron a few times a week. We would each take a day to go to Akron to do some of these procedures when we didn't have it here or when we thought they were high risk. Um, we were putting a lot of miles on our cars and we were aging pretty, pretty quickly, as you can <laughs> tell from my gray hair. <laughs> so. So one of, uh, one of our goals was to see how much of this care can we have locally and deliver the same quality that you can have elsewhere. And that was one of the impetus to have Dr. Dowd from Ohio State come here. Because if you can do the same thing in the same lab here in Worcester, why travel 75 miles to Columbus or 65 miles to Cleveland? Now, with the building of the cath lab, the other thing it enabled us to do was to introduce other procedures, which we would never have been able to treat here in Worcester. I talked to you about doing ultrasounds to diagnose abdominal aortic aneurysms. And as you know, aneurysms are <coughs> fatal conditions. If you have an aneurysm which is bursting or dissecting, every minute and every hour counts. But some of these conditions can be treated in the cath lab. Uh, and two physicians who are on staff now, Dr. Bob Siebel, that many of you know, and Dr. Butler, um, who are trained in performing some of these procedures, could also utilize the cath lab, which we're using to do angiograms, to put in stents. And this is an example of a stent in someone's aorta, which unfortunately does not project very well, but you can see this mesh over here, and there's actually another mesh over here. So he goes through the groin, and then they put a catheter in, and then they deliver this mesh, which goes within the blood vessel. And because it's within the blood vessel, it looks like a sleeve within a sleeve and so the blood vessel cannot burst. This is a remarkable procedure. It's done in a day or two, the patients go home. 
and we do this here in the cath lab uh, and we've actually been very successful uh, with this procedure. Now we've always thought about how can we make things easier, how can we make sure that we're on the cutting edge, how do we make sure that we are competing with the Clevelands, the Akrons, the Columbuses, etc. Um, <coughs> now the Europeans have actually been doing hard caths through the wrist for a number of years and so I heard about this and I said, we should be able to do this in Worcester as well. So um, one of my chief technologists and this bloke decided that we'll go get some training in doing radial hard cats. And radial is just, we, uh, the radial artery is the vessel which runs um, uh, just on your arm there. So we got training for that. Um, and we successfully performed the first radial catheterization on this gentleman here. The remarkable thing about this is you don't have to lie down for six hours. Immediately after the heart catheterization, he got off the table and we just put a little band around his wrist. And he had his breakfast, which I know is, is dear to lots of people. When can they eat <laughs> after they have these procedures? So within two hours, he was out of the hospital. That is the fascinating thing about radial catheterizations. And now we are actually treating heart attacks through the wrist, which makes it infinitely safer, it's infinitely more comfortable. Uh, people who have back problems can actually sit down and recover. We got recliners in the cath lab so that um, they can be having their meal or breakfast or whatever it is and talk to their significant other while they are recovering. Uh, I'm sure some of you have had heart catheterizations and were terrified of that sandbag or somebody pressing on your groin for what seemed to be forever. Uh, with a radial heart cath, you didn't have to do any of that or you don't have to do any of that. So that's another advancement that we offered here. And actually, I am proud to say that we offered radial heart catheterizations here at the same time that hospitals in Akron and Cleveland were offering radial heart catheterizations. Now, the other thing that um, Worcester Hospital has allowed us to do is to give us a bit of an international flavor. Because of our cath lab, and some of us having some ties to overseas, we have actually been able to bring patients who are in less fortunate circumstances here to Worcester to be treated. So this gentleman here is from Ghana originally. I visited, and I'm sure some of you read about this, um, where he called my father and said he was having some problems and I was getting ready to get on the plane. So I listened to his history. And I said, okay, when I get to Worcester, I'll talk to the people in Worcester and see whether we can have him come over and, and be treated here. So I did that. He flew over on his own account and came here and we did a heart catheterization on him. Everything went well. Uh, and um, he lived happily ever after. But he's been eternally grateful to Worcester and the community of Worcester for helping him. For those who are, for those who are concerned, he actually paid his own way here and also paid for the procedure himself. But we offered him a cath lab, which in Ghana, in a population of 23 million, there is no cath lab, or at least at the time, there was no cath lab. Had we not performed that procedure, I'm not sure this gentleman would have been with us. And since then, we brought a number of people who've had uh, similar procedures over here. And I think at the end of the presentation, you'll probably understand why Worcester is going to get on the map a lot more for um, more interesting things uh, rather than just drugs and opiate deaths and other things that you read about in the daily record. <coughs> so after doing heart catheterization since 2000, 
or 2001, um, we felt that we had to go to the next frontier. And we had been working towards this uh, diligently. Actually, it was my goal and the hospital's goal when we started high catheterizations that one day we will do angioplasty here in Worcester. Um, an angioplasty or PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention, is being able to put a stent in a blood vessel that is narrowed or completely closed like that initial film that I, I showed you. So we had to make sure that we had the facility, we had to make sure that the personnel was available, and then of course oversight. And there were some people who thought that Worcester was too small for us to do a procedure like this, or to subject people to procedures like this, especially since we didn't have open heart surgery backup. And in fact, the state of Ohio did not allow hospitals our size to perform angioplasty unless you had cardiac surgery. You can see from this map here, which many of you will recognize in the United States, um, there were some states up here where they didn't permit any angioplasty at all if you didn't have open heart surgery. And then there were other states where you could have an angioplasty done. It wasn't regulated. It was wild country. I don't want to say wild west, but it was the wild west. <laughs> or is the wild west, I should say. Uh, and then there were states like Ohio Oh, sorry, there were states like Pennsylvania which were permitted and they were regulated and monitored. And then there were very restrictive regulatory states like California, Ohio, where they allowed only certain institutions to perform this. So we petitioned the state over and over again. Trials were being done where they were comparing angioplasty done in big institutions like Ohio State, Cleveland Clinic, Akron General, versus hospitals which did not have open heart surgery, like Robinson Memorial or Knox Community Hospital uh, in Knox County. Now, this was actually not rocket science. It had been done in Europe for years and years and was noted to be safe. But we needed to run those trials in the US for us to be convinced. And when the trial results came out, there was no difference between having an angioplasty done in a hospital this size without surgery versus bigger hospitals, so long as it was being done by the appropriate personnel, the facility, was good, and there was adequate oversight. And we thought, we had all those, so why couldn't we do it here? So we set about looking for someone who had special training in angioplasty to complement our services here, to be able to render that service, and then also petition the state and about, a, well actually not a year ago, uh, almost a year ago, Ohio finally decided that hospitals such as ours could perform angioplasty without open heart surgery backup. We had recruited Dr. Newton a few years before and he was patiently waiting for this day to come where we could do such a thing. But in the meantime, if we performed a heart catheterization here and the person needed angioplasty, we would send them to a tertiary care hospital, specifically Akron General or Akron City, and sometimes Altman, uh, that is where he had privileges, and he would perform these stenting procedures there. He was actually one of my partners in Akron for about 12 or 13 years before coming to Worcester. So he came to join us, uh, and together we developed the angioplasty program and he was going to be the forerunner of this program. 
Now, why is it important to be able to perform angioplasty in a hospital such as ours? Um, I've told you about the convenience, possibly. But also, if you are having a heart attack, the most critical thing is the time it takes for them to open that blood vessel. So time becomes muscle. Now, if you have a heart attack and you come to Worcester Hospital, how long do you think it would take you to get to the closest hospital around here? Can anyone? 45 minutes. 45 minutes? An hour? Anyone else? Sorry? By helicopter? Sure. How long did it take you? 15 minutes. And how, how much was your bill for the helicopter? $8,000. 50. 50. So $50,000. It took 15 minutes. Um, and I can't afford $50,000. Uh, maybe she can. So, <laughs> so um, you know, uh, yeah, thank God for insurance. Um, so we had to worry about muscle, and also was it safe for the patients? Now there's one little known fact. Many people did okay, but what they didn't realize was that they did not save as much heart muscle because it took an hour or an hour and a half to get to the closest facility. So you may be alive, but your heart function would not be normal. And because your heart function is not normal, you may need a defibrillator. Versus if you have that procedure within 30 minutes or 45 minutes, you would save more heart muscle, you would recover quicker, and you would not need a defibrillator. So time is muscle. It's not just where you have the procedure done. It's how quickly it can be done, how safely it can be done, and what the residual heart muscle is, what we call the ejection fraction. The residual heart muscle function is the ejection fraction. So you go to your cardiologist's office, and they often throw this number around of you know, 40% or 50% or 35%, and the key number is 35%. If your heart function is less than 35%, you become high risk. If it's more than 35%, you're low risk. The other great thing about doing angioplasties here is that we reduce transfers, so you don't have the $50,000 bill. Uh, and then we're also able to perform surgeries on patients who are sicker and who would have been thought to be high risk. I'm sure there are a few of you in this room who may have come in here with a gallbladder problem or an appendix problem, but because you had heart disease, the surgeon was a little reticent or was, not, was hesitant to take you to surgery uh, because they didn't want anything to happen to you and we couldn't do angioplasty, so they transferred you to Hospital St. Elsewhere to get your gallbladder done in 20 minutes. But you know, with the advent of angioplasty, we would be able to, to perform some of these surgeries locally. And then, of course, we also had to bolster our ICU services, ICU intensive care unit services, because if we're going to keep a lot of these people here, some of them are sicker, we need physicians, so we got two pulmonologists in critical care who can manage ventilators um, properly the way we would want. So this is a slide which I don't think you can see very well, but it was a slide that we presented and statistics that we've collected just to show people the safety of what we're doing. So this is since 2001, the number of patients who'd had a heart catheterization or had had procedures, uh, peripheral, we put some balloon pumps in, some pacemakers, um, and you can see the total for the heart catheterization was almost 6,000. And the number of deaths Three. So 6,000 procedures and three deaths. We did have some cardiac arrests, but
but very few of them, but there were only three deaths, so we were able to resuscitate them. Okay, the total number of patients that we had treated <coughs> were over 10,000. And these were the only complications that we saw, a little bit of bleeding. So it was, we established that it's incredibly safe to do heart catheterizations. And, and so we set about that, okay, let's go ahead and get this angioplasty done over here. So we had to renovate our lab. And because we had to renovate our lab, we had to find temporary digs. So we got this little mobile cat suite because we still didn't want to, for two or three months, do nothing. Um, and then we got the architects to give us some new drawings, which hopefully one of you, one of, um, all of you will be able to walk through and see where we are. Um, this was the old cath lab equipment, which it looks like tube TV. Um, my staff still laughs at me that I probably have tube TV at home. Um, but now we've got a flat screen TV. There's a new lab here. It's, uh, as my, my uh, head lab technician says, it's sweet. Uh, I don't know how you can use that to describe uh, an item you're not eating, but, <laughs> but he likes to say that. Um, <coughs> so as of now, we provide pacemaker services, defibrillator services, uh, we treat various forms of heart disease, we do stress testing, we do EKGs, echo tests, TEEs, cardiac rehab, and in late December, we started doing angioplasty and stenting in Worcester Hospital. It was um, led by Dr. Newton, uh, and we also had Dr. Rahan, uh, who is also um, he works in collaboration with Dr. Newton, so Dr. Newton is not on call all the time. Uh, and all of us pitch in uh, to help. So that's Dr. Rahan. And this is Eric Radiker, who is, he was one of our first interventional patients. So this gentleman, I think he's 32 years old. And 38 years old, and um, uh, you probably come across his story soon. But he was an otherwise fit guy. He's the band director at Norway High. He was actually exercising on his. Um, it wasn't a treadmill. What's that other thing? Elliptical. elliptical that's it. You see, You're, yes. So he was exercising on his elliptical, uh, and started getting what he thought was heartburn. So he did what we've told people not to do, but he did it nonetheless. He got his significant other to drive him to the hospital. So they drove him to the hospital, and when he got to the hospital, we did an EKG and found that he was having a heart attack. And this is kind of what it looks like when you have a complete blockage of the heart vessel. So the vessel is supposed to make a C like this, and you can see how here it it abruptly stops over here. And so the intervention goes in with a wire across and then opens up a balloon over here where the blockage is. And then voila, this is the way it looks. So initially that picture ended over here and this is the way the whole heart muscle is feeding the back side of his heart and the bottom of his heart. Now, so since December through a few days ago, we've already done 45 angioplasties, with nine of them being heart attacks. The average door to balloon time, now door to balloon time is when you hit the door of the emergency room, the clock starts ticking. How long does it take you to get the blood vessel open? So the average door to balloon time in Worcester Hospital in December is 48 minutes, in January is 49 minutes. Can you tell me where you would be in 49 minutes if we transported you out of Worcester? <laughs> the fastest door to balloon time was under 30 minutes, a shorter period of time than I've been talking this afternoon. That is remarkable. There is no way that 
anyone in Worcester, until this program was set up, would be able to achieve a door to balloon time that short. It is just physically impossible. Now, those who have made this possible is through years of dedication. And I'm proud to say that we've assembled a phenomenal staff in cardiovascular. Some of you recognize, or many of you recognize some of them. There's Chad, there's Lon, there's Dusk, there's Kelly, there's Courtney, there's Daryl here, who's, he was my first person who I hired, who's been with me all these years. Um, there's Lucinda. There's Phyllis, there's Marilyn, and then there's my colleague, Dr. Mudispa, and then Dr. Newton uh, over here. Uh, and they have all played a major role in getting us where we are today. There are some acknowledgments that we have to make, because efforts like this are not done by through the effort of one person, two people, three people, but it takes a team. And it takes a little bit more than a team. I think the vision of the president or CEO of the hospital, Mr. Sharon, was very important in getting us to where we are today. Because there are many CEOs who would have been just happy where they were and say, this is a small community hospital. Let's just keep things local. We don't need to expand and they'll continue and everybody will be happy in their little environment. The Worcester Community Hospital itself being receptive to this and other departments encouraging us to keep going, to keep doing it, looking forward to it. The Worcester Community Hospital Board for also believing that we could do such a procedure or offer such services, not only with the angioplasty, but with pacemakers, with defibrillators, with heart catheterizations, and to be able to do it safely here, we have to thank them. I certainly thank all my partners um, who together we've been able to, to achieve this. Um, the marketing department has been great in getting the word out to other people uh, and also to give me the opportunity to be able to share some of these stories. Uh, with all of you. And of course the entire medical staff of Worcester Hospital um, has also been very supportive. Some have been a little slow in coming along, but eventually they came along. And most importantly, I think the senior partners. Many of you have been partners with us in this journey. And I hope you will remain partners. And I can promise you we will not let you down. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Maybe a few questions? I wonder if I'm misinformed, mm -hmm. because I thought that my husband had a defibrillator pacemaker combination. So heck. Those figures for her separately. Her question was that she wonders whether she's been misinformed because her husband had a defibrillator pacemaker. No, you have not been misinformed. I, I probably did not tell you the whole story, but all defibrillators have a pacemaker function. All pacemakers do not have a defibrillator function. Oh, okay. So the defibrillator has all defibrillators have a pacemaker function. Yes. Thank you for being here. I hope you stay a long time. <laughs> Thank you. Her comment was that uh, she hopes I stay a long time. <laughs> I, I hope to stay a long time. Can I ask another one? What is the difference between the mesh that you showed on the outside of the heart and the stents? What was the difference between the mesh on the... Uh, that mesh I showed was actually not... No, it was in the blood, in the aorta. Okay. And the stent is within the blood vessel. So it's the same thing. It's just that the aorta is a much bigger blood vessel uh, than, the, than the, the arteries around the heart, which are you know, between two and four millimeters. Yes, sir. Is 
there different criteria for for doing catheterizations through the wrist or through the thigh? So the question was whether there are different criteria for doing catheterizations through the wrist or the thigh. Yes, there are. Um, you know, if you've had a lot of bypass surgeries, sometimes it's difficult to get to those vessels through the wrist. Um, you, could, you could do it maybe through the left wrist, but it, it just takes a little bit more, it's a little more technically challenging. Um, you know, people who have severe disease like that vessel uh, I showed you, which the aorta I showed you, which had the, the big stents in, uh, if I had to craft that patient, I would probably want to go through the wrist rather than go through, through that mesh. Um, uh, I think people who have back problems, uh, who cannot lie down, um, you want to go through that. But more and more, we are doing procedures through the wrist. Uh, like I said, in some places in Europe, they are doing 70-75% of their procedures through the wrist. Some of the heart attack victims who've come here We've actually done their heart attack through the wrist, and, and they go up to the ICU, uh, and they're sitting in their chairs. Yes, sir. Is the mesh, mesh that's used for an aneurysm an open mesh? Or is that a seal? Does it provide a seal inside the artery? It's an open mesh, but some of them can be covered. So you can have the mesh and you can have a covering around it. Okay, but, but you know, for the aorta, of course, you know, you want it to be covered. So, but you can't see that cover on the, you know, through the x-ray. You just see the, the mesh around it. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you. And like I said, it's, it's because of the support from, from all of you and from people like you, because um, there were times that people got very discouraged um, that, uh, you know, maybe it wasn't the right thing to do. Um, yes, ma'am. Is that something that can be done here now, or is that in future plans? So her question was that she has an aortic valve replacement and has a relative who may need to have that done, um, and can we do that here? So the aortic valve replacement or valve surgery is not something that we can do here now. Uh, and I know there are a few people in this room who probably have that as well. Um, for those surgeries, you do need open heart surgery. Now, there are some techniques now that you can actually replace the aortic valve through the groin. Uh, and I do have a few patients who've had that done, but we don't do that just yet. Remember, our program is young. Um, even this procedure about doing um, aortic valve through the groin uh, is also in its infancy uh, in, in certainly in the States. Um, I don't want to say never, um, but you never know. Yes, sir. I've had them all. I'm 79 years old. I've had a heart attack, open heart surgery. I've had the stents put in. I've had balloons put in. And I also have a pacemaker. Combination. Combination. <laughs> And I'm still kicking. <laughs> <laughs> but when he is Good for you. You, you must be her husband. Yeah. When he had his first heart attack was in 93, and of course I was putting this together with what you were saying, and of course then once they got him stabilized, then he had to go to Cleveland Clinic. See, that's what happens after you. Somebody takes care of you for 60 years. <laughs> hey, they have a chance to get it on. Uh, silence is sometimes golden. 
<laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, everyone. thank you so much for coming, and uh, I hope you have you've had a good evening and happy heart month to you all. <laughs>